Welcome back, Venerable Rubina. Yes, thank you, everybody, and hello, everybody. So let's okay, continue. Rest. Mm -hmm. All right. Rest. So gallery view now. I'm putting in the gallery view as well. There we go. Okay, there darling people, see. are there any questions for a start? Are there any questions about what we've discussed so far? Any old thing? Yes. Yes, I can yeah. see you. Yes, Stephen. Yeah, I was just wondering, obviously, you, you said... Um, well, like our thoughts, words, and actions um, sow the seeds of our, our future karma. That's right, a future and, reality. Not even karma, just we create yeah. ourselves, Stephen. Everything we think is and do and also, say produces a future person we become. Is, is there also an element of our words and, and, and actions and, and thoughts um, being like a, a product of our past? Of our past karma, I thought, like driven by. Well, if like, I mean, things, that's pretty reasonable, like, isn't it? That's logical. It has yeah. to be that. Everything that you think about it, just in general, we know this is scientific. In general, everything that exists this moment, whether it's a flower, a building, a moment of anger in your mind, how can it not be the product of the past causes? So, that's logic. Isn't so, where, where, does the, where, where does, like, um, sort of where does free will or whatever come into that then? I know, but think, is, is... Before, I know, but first of all, I understand your question. First of all, I knew you were going to ask that. It's okay. First of all, okay. we've got to, we've, we've got to, I think we have got to give the appropriate source to this concept of free will. It's actually a Christian teaching coming from God that God made me and God gave me what they call free will. So, I mean, everybody talks about it like some scientific fact but it's a particular Christian mm -hmm. teaching. So let's dismiss that. So what, put it in Buddha's terms, you're asking me what, um, so I mean, it's even, it's like, what's the implication of your question? The implication of your question, we all ask it, is that if there are past causes, it assumes to us there's no choice, right? That's what you're implying, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Right, well, okay, let me ask you, give me an example. If you, understand the law of cause and effect of botany you know that yeah. if you see a flower a rose in your garden what was the main cause of it uh, be the seed right see, and it would be a rose seed wouldn't it it would be uh -huh. a rose seed wouldn't it yes okay so do you have a problem with that no you don't do you no, so just... why do you have the problem with the fact that if a moment of anger arises in your mind, why do you have a problem with the fact that that has to have come from a previous similar cause? Why is that a problem for you? It's a good point. To, think... It's a good way to put it. Why is that a problem for you? Who put the seed there? Did, 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 um, but was it... Like, if, if I have the choice whether I water the seed or Forget not... Forget the word or, choice. Or... Forget the word choice. Don't, don't worry about that. Right. Let's look at the simple logic. If... The, the general principle is whatever exists at this moment, we know logically is the pro, is the product of the process of cause and effect. So we're talking about a moment of anger. We're talking about a rose in your garden. So each of those is, is a thing that exists and each of them has previous causes. So you know very well that a rose in your garden has causes, but just because the rose is there doesn't mean you're paralyzed and that you can't water it or pull it out. So in the same way with anger has to have a cause, it can't come out of nowhere. So therefore, but it doesn't follow you with another part of your mind called wisdom can analyze anger, make a decision that it's not cool, and then you can not you can stop nourishing anger. Just because, just other words, just because something's got a cause doesn't mean you can't change. Doesn't mean you can't do other things. It's a, it's just reason. It's not it's not reasonable to think that. But we tend to always think that and always ask that question. Yeah. So, so we do have an element of of sort of not element. Say in our, I mean, not element. Not element. No, no. Listen, listen. <clears throat> if you don't know botany, you don't know there's such a law, then there is no choice. You just allow the garden to grow because you never thought of the idea of intervening. So, calm, you know, botany takes care. The, the rose will grow and then the, the other ones will grow and they will just run over. And they will, But you can learn botany and know how to work with it. Well, karma is a natural law insofar as whatever we think and do and say is the fruit of what we've done. Now, if we don't know there's such a law, 
then we'll just follow it blindly and keep creating more suffering for ourselves. But the Buddha says we can learn to know this law and learn to navigate it and work with it and make changes. Yeah. It's intelligence, you know. Do you understand so it my comes point? back to spiritual practice. The, Absolutely, like the every day, do. training yourself. I mean, everything runs according to a law. You know, if you everything so when you learn that law then you can learn to work with that law and be in charge of it that's the point yeah cool so if I've we but you. you know but also put it this way you know you could argue that sometimes effectively it's like we've got no choice and that would only be the situation well let's say there's a person who really you know a strong karmic habit to kill anything 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 at all you could almost, or even, no, no, even use a good example. Let's say a person comes into this life, and there are so many examples on YouTube, I'm blown out by these little children who can play Bach and Chopin at the age of five. You know, they're so astonishing, you can't believe your eyes. So you could argue for that little boy, there's one little Russian boy in particular, he came, he's from such strong practice of music in a past life. He comes into this life fully programmed. He just goes at the piano and in one minute he can learn it. You could almost argue that he doesn't have a choice but to play music because the habit is so strong. But of course he does have a choice. But the, when the habit is strong, whether it's good or bad, then the habit is so deep. So a person who's got a, such a deep habit to lie or such a deep habit to kill from countless lifetimes, it's like even if they hear the option, well, you know, you could stop lying, they won't even be able to hear it because the habit is so deep. But finally, fundamentally, we all, nothing is set in stone. We have choice, but it's hard work, you know, when the habits yeah. are strong. You get my point? Yeah, yeah, Good. I do, yeah, Good. thank you. Good point, thank you so much. Okay, there was a question of Sus and then Gabi. Good, go on then. Sus, unmute yourself. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Go, oh, darling, talk to me. Here comes this. We question, Rabina. Yes. The state of mind of fear. Yes. Is there any particular good practices to do? It's the only state of mind I find it's hard to be a witness to. Yes, exactly. It's absolutely all pervasive. Mm, exactly. Any suggestions? No, it's a very, I think we should, again, look at the analysis of it. And it's very fascinating to even hear this. The Buddha's fundamental point in the Buddhist model of the mind, as I described, we've got all the neurotic, unhappy, delusional habits, attachment, anger, jealousy, fear, all those dramas. And then we have the virtuous ones, love, compassion. And that, it kind of, there's something primordially n ridiculous about the negative ones. One of their key functions, like I said, is that they're, they're delusional, that we've made up these ancient stories and we believe totally. When we, the anger comes, we really believe the husband's ugly. When the attachment comes, we really believe the cake is delicious. And all, and so, but the interesting, fascinating point is, all the virtuous states of mind, you look, check at your experience. When you're when more when reasonableness, when you're being intelligent, when you're being able to see things from a different point of view, when you're loving, when you're kind, check this out. Your mind's peaceful, your mind is spacious, it might be difficult, but there's no fear. Now look at the others. They are, their nature is fear. There's all, in the list of neurotic states of mind in Buddhist psychology, fear doesn't have its own status because all of them are rooted in fear. And the root delusion, the primordial one of the wrong sense of self, which is so primordial we don't even see it, it's like a sleeping lion most of the time, its absolute nature is fear. And then attachment and anger and all the others are branch delusions, are voices of that one. So they're all in the nature of fear. So when anxiety gets too strong, when anger gets too strong, Strong, when jealousy gets too strong, you analyze it. You're just living in fear. It's like you're gripped, it's concrete, you can't handle it, your mind's berserk. They are in their nature fear. So if we describe fear in its own self as when it's really powerful, like when you nearly get attacked by somebody or you live in fear of what could happen. You know, one person on one class, she said, I live in fear all day, my husband will die. It's very intense when you just, you can't cope. So when you analyze it, fear is the flavor of all the delusions. I think we've got to be more precise and analyze which delusion is it. It might just not, general feeling is fear, but is it anger? Is it worried about the future? Is it, is it you know, what, we've got to label it more precisely. So with that information, what do you think? How would you say when you talk about fear, what are you actually referring to? 
when you say those things, I can see those. But my main one, which I find really hard to just stay as a witness to, is like more existential fear. I know, but it's trying to describe, what, give an example of an experience of it. Because all of them are fear. I mean, I'm not, I know your point, but listen to this point, Sas. You look, if you look at a person who's screaming in rage, a little child having a fit, Really analyse this. It's very interesting. We'll just go. Oh, look at Mary. She's ha she's having it. She's angry. But analyse Mary. This little girl. Her eyes are wide in horror. Spit coming out of her mouth. She's screaming, crying about her little brother. What her brother's doing? I'm going to kill him. He's evil. He's caught. I mean, if you don't think that's not primordial fear, I don't know what it is. But we just say, oh, that's anger. She's having a complete mental breakdown. That's fear, sweetheart. But we don't label it fear. When you talk about existential fear, I mean, it's interesting. But in the end, ego grasping the root delusion, when like you're driving the car and you're nearly, at, nearly, in, you're nearly run over, then the heart beats fast. Or if in daily life we have the panic attacks. Are you talking about panic attacks? I'm actually talking about almost in meditation, almost co coming to this absolute fear place. Okay, you mean you're meditating, what kind of meditation? Just sitting meditation. Yeah, I know, but what, what are you meditating on? Be more precise if you can. What's yeah, the meditation basically actually? Just being, being present to the pause between the breaths. At okay, you're point. doing that. Okay, so what all is happening then? Okay, now I understand. You're being more precise. It's so helpful. So what you're talking about is whenever we start to work with our mind, our mind is pretty powerful, and I would, depending on the meditation you're describing, or if you do Mahamudra or you're meditating on emptiness, then it can trigger fear. Well, this is excellent. Don't be scared of it. You can't disappear. The primordial feeling is I'm going to disappear. You can't disappear, Sas. Lama Zopa says when we're really properly, properly meditating on the understanding of emptiness of intrinsic nature, which I'll not talk about before we finish our class, because this is the final way to get rid of samsara, then it's really powerful not to resist it. But if you don't know what you're doing with your mind, and if you don't have a, you know, using the Buddhist uh, logic, if you don't have the proper Buddha, the Buddhist view of what the mind is and what are the delusions and what working and how they work, then you won't. People go mad. Many people go mad when they start to meditate because they don't know what to do with it that, that happens. So that's why I'm asking. So with you, it seems to be like you, you, your mind is calming down. You're getting a, a and then suddenly there's a feeling of no self. You've kind of freaked. So you freak out, right? Yes or not? Well, you have to describe to me. I can't answer you. If you don't tell me exactly, I can't answer. We've got to be quite precise yeah, I'm here. Trying, I'm trying to be specific. Good, yes. I, can, I can be quite comfortable with almost having no self. And then it's almost like this thing arises. So assuming that that is from my mind, but it's so quick, I'm not noticing. That's it. right, exactly. So it's fear yeah. arises. That's yeah. a, so it's a good sign. But if you, okay. you've, you've got to know it's a good sign. You've got to know what to do with it. And that's why if you don't have a proper system, we you don't have proper teachers, we can easily lose the plot. I'm not, I don't know what your system is. I'm not trying to criticise you. I'm just talking. So if we know what's going on and we know how to analyse it, we'll know what to do with it when it arises. Am I help? Is this helpful or not? Yes. No. But sure? My question is, is there any particular practices that within that might be useful to be doing to sort of assist this space? But that's sort of the way I'm describing it is the exact method is by knowing okay. what's going on. By knowing, in other words, if you don't know botany and you don't know why flowers and weird weirds are growing, you're going to have fear. You'll be panicking. But if you know botany, you'll know how to explain why it's happening. Are you seeing that point? So I don't yeah. know if you've got the Buddhist view of the mind. Yeah. I don't know if you have or haven't, and I'm not forcing you to have it. But I'm saying is if you have a sound understanding of the Buddhist view of the mind, I'm only describing the Buddhist one. I can't describe anything else. You need meditating on its own without knowing what the mind is and how it functions, what all the delusions are. It's sort of like playing with fire a little bit. This is the Buddhist approach. So if you've got a really clear Buddhist analysis, if you've got a really clear analysis of botany, and I'll come rushing in, mommy, mommy, this weird thing just grew. I'm scared. I don't know what it is. And you're, oh, darling, it's all right, because you know botany. Then you know what to do with it. You know how to interpret it. That's my answer to you. You have to know how to interpret it according to whatever system you're using. I can't, I can't force the Buddhist one on you, and I don't even know if you are Buddhist. I'm just, are you sort of seeing what I'm trying to get at? Yes, thank you. Any experience we have, sweetheart, whether it's in cooking, anything, this is a really interesting point. It almost seems too simple. If we don't know why it's happening, if we haven't got the logic behind it, if we don't know the system, so in here, in this case, if we don't know what the mind is, how it functions, what its potential is, what all the various, if we don't have an analysis, then it's a bit like meditating without that, and I'm not suggesting you haven't got a system, I'm just talking, then that could be, you could play with, you don't know what to do with what arises, you don't know how to interpret it. So that's up to you to look into the systems and see if you want a system to help you interpret it. 
That's the answer to your question, if that's helpful, darling. I don't know if it is. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. But the Buddha's approach would be, if you do know what you're doing, having fear is the existential fear of a fear of not being or fear of losing yourself. It's a good sign, but you've got to know what to do with it. And that's based on understanding the, the model and how it, when the mind works and what to do with it. I'm not trying to ignore your... I'm trying to... Anyway, I've answered the best I can. Thank you. Good, darling. Thank you so much. What else, people? Then Gabi has her hands up. Yes, Gabi. Uh, Gabi. Yeah, I had, I had, um, I have actually two questions. Good. Uh, yeah. I'll just lower my hand again. Yes. So, um, um, so one of them came when you were talking about this guy who was in the middle of his two and a half year retreat yes. and just uh, got to level five. I know you once said quite a while ago. You once said the Buddhists are obsessed. Oh, probably it wasn't you. I'm not sure. Uh, obsessed uh -huh. with numbers. So I didn't say, I've, I've never said that. <laughs> Nothing. I think numbers are great, but go on. I, I love numbers. We're gone. That's fine. Um, but uh, I think I was thinking, so why does this all take so endlessly long? Several what? lifetimes. Yeah, endless, okay. uh, this, yeah. this, this being, uh, this, this, this business of refining consciousness. Yes. Uh, why does it take so long? That's the first question. Okay, good. Let's answer that what? one first. Let's uh, just take that one first, shall we? Should we take that and one first? Second, yeah, we can, we can take that first. Absolutely. Good. Okay. Yeah. So it, it all depends on the person. So the, using the analogy of learning music, if you, like the little Russian boy I'm talking about, who since he's about three, has been incredibly excellent on the piano. Now I see him as about nine or ten. He's just unbelievable. So then the, the question, so then you can see for him, it didn't take him long, did it? He's accomplished levels of uh, levels of, of, of advancement in music that most people won't achieve in one life. So what's the logical reason, using the view of karma, why would he be so good at piano at the age of six? What's the logical answer if we take the view of karma? I mean, you said that he has, a, he has kind of a, a, a sown this seed in another life but that doesn't answer the question because it does time no wait a minute but hang on a second darling no i understand but first at the simplest level if okay let me ask another another simple way in general so let's say we have you know you're a cook and then a couple of us come to class and one person picks it up very quickly and understands how to be, be a cook very quickly another person takes longer in general what would be the reason for that do you think Free experience price thank you very much you just answered the question so some people come into this life as one of our teachers she's a female she's a tibetan she's a female she's a lama and lama zoba said she came into this life fully developed meaning she's done the work in the past someone else has to spend 40 years in this life having to do the amount of work to get to where she is so the answer to why it ta if it takes long is because you haven't done the work why does it take a long time? Because you, you've got that much work to do. Why does it take less time? Because you've done the work before. So does that answer your question or not in general? No, well, it doesn't. Okay, so what? tell me which piece is missing, darling. Because you just postponed the, uh, uh, the explanation in the past. I'm sorry, uh, I didn't understand. Sorry, I, forgive me. What was that point, sweetheart? What, say it again. It's a very good point. I need to understand it. What's the point? Yeah, uh, the point is... If you say, okay, it, it could take shorter in this lifetime, but then the work has to be done in a lifetime before. So why in all do of we us. need yeah, sorry, billions and billions of lifetimes to get there? Oh, okay. So let, okay. So let, then and whether it's a billion good. lifetimes or one lifetime, the answer is the same. Some people today are already the Buddha. So they must have done the work, isn't it? So some people aren't a Buddha, so they haven't done the work. So... How come that can't answer the question? What's missing in that qu I really, I, I love your question, but I want to try and see what I'm missing. Are you, asking, are, you, are you asking the question, how come we have beginningless lives? How come we have countless past lives? Is that what you're asking? How come that the, uh, the de development of consciousness takes countless lives? Or whatever it is, there is the idea that something is refining more and more and more, and that that's there's right. that... So what's the alternative to taking countless lives? What's the alternative? What would it look like instead that would make you happy? I mean, my answer to the question has to be the same. If at this moment in time, darling, if this moment in time, Gabby, you or I are at a certain level of development, whether it's music, cooking or 
consciousness, surely that tells us that that's how long it has taken. Not why should it take that long. The answer is mm. it is taking that long. Yeah. I mean, you can, there's no point in saying why. It means if, if I am only at the level of grade two, that means I haven't done the work. And it might be countless lives that I've taken not to do the work. But there is a, the real point for me is there is the possibility that the, all the methods are there, that you could do it very quickly. There are methods. So then, that, then maybe it just indicates we've never had the proper methods. I mean, I'm not talking Buddhism or Mickey Mouse here. I don't care. But if it is countless lives, that's the reality where we're at. So it implies, so in this life, whatever we come into this life with, all we can do is work with that and know there are methods there. Again, I don't care if you call it Christianity and Monkey Mouse, that I can do it quickly if I practice. I mean, if I want to become like Federer, why does it take me so long? Well, maybe the answer is I only play on Sundays. But if I play seven days a week, eight hours a day, I will do it very quickly. So it's a question of how much commitment we put into the job, whether it's music or consciousness. If we just do it a few hours a day, it's going to take a while. So some people have already accomplished it because they may be worked at it day and night. I mean, Federer got to, I'm just using any body of knowledge. The more you engage in it, the more likely you're going to get the result. So maybe it yeah. implies why we're not there now is because we haven't engaged in, in, in the practice. I mean, I can only deduce that if this is the, do you understand my point? I'm sort of getting at, Gabby. Yeah. It's a good, very good point, darling. It's a very good point. So well, tell us your second question. Uh, the second question kind of while you were saying that is kind yeah. of uh, uh, very close to that one because yeah. it is, um, let's say, okay, I, I don't want to become Federer. Yeah. So I will not practice that. That's right. And I think that already the question is, why is it so much more uh, 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 interesting to not be an aunt anymore, to not be an aunt anymore in the next life? Probably being an aunt is actually quite nice. Well, that's, that all you can do with that is listen to the different systems and how they present it and what the type of mind of an ant is. All I can do, all I can do the little bit of knowledge I've got, Garby, is the Buddhist analysis. That's, mm -hmm. So Buddhism for me is my working hypothesis at the moment. I, I don't have other systems. I don't know what the Christians think. I don't know what the Muslims think. A little bit. I know a little bit. But all I'm working with the Buddhist analysis. And, and that would tell me that the mind of an animal, a lion, a dog, or an ant, the suffering is beyond bearing, but I, I'm not just going to accept that. But when I look at the Buddhist model of the mind, which describes the unhappy states of mind, the virtuous states of mind, and that we, and it's the model that refers to all beings, ants and dogs and humans. And the Buddhist view would be that humans is the best of a bad lot, not because humans are better, but because we at least as a human, we have access to some capacity to make changes, to some analysis of how we can understand suffering and what it is, and we can actually do some work of changing. That possibly as an ant or a giraffe, you don't have much choice. And the Buddhist view would be about ignorance, the suffering of ego grasping. Animals have it like a billion times stronger than humans. All I can do is give you the Buddhist view, and all I can do is look into it myself. I'm not telling you, tell you it's right or wrong. So, for example, I remember Lama Zopa saying one time, if you, we had a direct experience of the mind of our little dog, who we think is so cute and happy, if we had a direct experience of the mind of a, our little dog, its mental suffering of this ego grasping, of attachment, of anger, of fears. Fear, in other words, is rampant, a billion times more powerful in the mind of a dog because they can't access much of their virtue. They can't access much of their ability to make changes, to think about things and understand things. But the level of thinking, which we can use as a tool to harm, is the one ability we've got as a human, which is the tool we can use to get the hell out of this mess. So we've got to look into the Buddhist view of the mind in order to get that answer. Not to believe it, but this is my working hypothesis right now. So yeah. I, you know, yeah. do you understand what I'm saying, Sweden? We okay. have a saying. Okay. Yeah, we have a saying, there's, don't we? That, that, there's I mean, an behind that. There's, there's, the, there's the assumption behind that that the, the human uh, mind and uh, getting out of uh, the way we get out of the suffering is just, uh, is just so, uh, so, uh, 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 so uh, worth of achieving, right? I sometimes thought I sometimes think my dog my dog is more of a bodhisattva than I can uh, ever be. I understand that. Honestly. So I understand, <laughs> we, and we can think that, isn't it? But I suppose if we want to be very really clear about it, we, if we, you know, the scientific approach would be to look into that and try try and see to prove it. So the only the Buddhist view would be the only way to prove that is for you to get clairvoyance, which you can get when you get single point of concentration, and with clairvoyance, which is 
totally part of the Buddhist system. It's been around for several thousand years, even for the, the Indians. And it's not just some hippy trippy vague notion that you can see something in a flash and then it's gone. When we've accessed our subtle level of mind through getting single point of concentration, the natural one of the natural capacities we have is because we've accessed a subtle level of mind, we can see directly the minds of others. And it's only then you will prove this point that Buddha is suggesting, that the suffering yep. of animals is the limitations of the fears of their mind are just beyond bearing. So it's interesting to think about, of course, and it's a powerful point. And we can't just, we can think what we like, but we need to have some, I suppose, some analysis of it. And all I can say is, again, I'm, my working hypothesis as, I've been, as I'm talking is the Buddhist view. I've got, to, I've got to work with something, you know. So I'm one step at a time. I don't just try to swallow it whole. I listen to it, think about it, try and observe the reality of it and go one step at a time. And as the Dalai Lama says, if I can prove the Buddha's wrong, then fine. I'll say thank you, Buddha, but goodbye. So I'm going one step at a time. It's all I can do. Do you understand, Gabby? Thank you. Good. But the fa another discussion is your dog could be a bodhisattva. Not because it's a dog, because it is a bodhisattva who's done the work as a human and now is manifesting as a dog for your benefit. That's another discussion. Good. Do you understand? <laughs> Fine. <laughs> Good. Good. Okay. What Thank else, you. People? What else, sweethearts? So we can continue. I think we've got to get to the root of the problem now, which is we've got to get to the university level, to the six perfections, and we've got to cut the root of all suffering, which is realized emptiness. So now we're going to have to squeeze our brains, okay? Can the I first just level. Check? Huh? Can I just check? Because Miranda, you had your hand oh. up. You still okay. have a question? Now your hand is down. Yeah, yeah yes. it, 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 it was a very, very basic question. Good, you asked me, darling. What is it? What is it? Um, I'm, I'm very new... I've only just come across the yes. um, Buddhist um, view of the mind yes. and there are so many books and videos and yes. things to learn and, and yes. I don't know where to start with I it I know, all. sweetheart, I really know that. <clears throat> but one, certainly, I think, um, okay, I know it's so complicated and if you study the mind in a, in a more advanced way, it just seems so complex because it's so sophisticated, the knowledge they've got about the mind. But my feeling mm. is, you know, you can, I think one of Lamy, I think a really good teachings are from Lamy Yeshi. He was very down to earth, talked about the mind in a wonderful way that's very tasty. You know, so any of Lama Yeshi's teachings, you know, if you look at his book, I think a really delicious book, and now that we're going to talk about emptiness, I really recommend it. It's called Mahamudra. It came out last year. It's called Mahamudra, How to Discover Our True Nature. The way Lama Yeshi always teaches is very delicious and it's always about how we are and about our mind. So one of his books is this one called Mahamudra, How to Discover Our True Nature. Another one is all his commentaries on these different practices, these meditation practices. One is, you know, um, one is called one a really nice one. One is called okay. What is which one I'm thinking about? Anyway, if you click onto the website lamayeshi.com, which is this archive of all the FPM materials of Lama Zopa Lama Yeshi's teachings, Lama Yeshi's teachings are very delicious. Give you a real taste of what of our, of our potential. And then if you want to get into more technical things, you can do that. But start with Lama Yeshi. It's so tasty, darling. I just Thank you that. so much. Good. Thank good, you. Good, 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 good. So, okay, this is now we're going to squeeze our brains here now, okay? We're going to get to the most difficult level. The first level, to stop the suffering of suffering, which is future suffering, we have to stop causing it, which means we use good ethics. Don't kill, don't steal, don't lie. And the next level is we get to the root of the problem, which is start to look at all the branch, all the attachment and the anger and the fears, which drive our actions. So here we start to harness all of this and become our own therapist, as Lama Yeshi puts it. And then we, here we really begin to give up the second kind of suffering. We start to understand the more subtle level of the mind and attachment and try to lessen the attachment, which means we grow our satisfaction. If we We've to some degree got good ethics and have learned to understand attachment and aversion, all these dramas, and learned to harness them. It's not that you've just given up things, it's you've become this marvelous, content, fulfilled, stable, joyful person. This is the fact, okay? Now, the next level got further suffering to get to, to get to the root of the problem. And this is where, you know, it gets more complicated and there's very vast in the literature. And this is the point at which the Buddha diverged from the previous yogis and scholars, the great Indians before him, you know. And this is where we talk about the way we exist ultimately, trying to get to the root delusion, which is known in general as ignorance in Tibetan. It's called Mahripa. But it's when it comes to the grasping itself, which is what Sasa's point is when we're meditating, this existential fear can arise. This is because it's attacking the root delusion. And they call it colloquially, 
ego grasping. This is so primordial. We don't have any real equivalent in modern psychology or philosophy. You know, it's very fascinating. The Buddha's view is we've got these, as I said, these layers and layers and layers of all these emotional afflict these unhappy emotions all of which have this function of misrepresenting reality to us it sounds pretty abstract we can see it with anger and attachment you know so the root of these which gives rise to anger and attachment and all the others is known as ego grasping this very primordial sense of a separate concrete real pointable findable me in there somewhere and it sounds all pretty abstract and it can sound quite nihilistic if we don't understand it properly. So basically Buddha's saying that this is the root of the problem. And one of the functions as a, res as a result of this ego grasping, the more strong that is, the more strong is our attachment, the more strong is our aversion, the more strong our fears. And this is the Buddhist view about the mind. Animals have this like a billion times more strong than we do. It's not evident when we see them. We just see what we see, you know. They're driven by incredible fear. Ego grasping is nature. I mean, this existential fear that Suss mentioned is what animals are living in all the time, it seems. It's not, I mean, we're all got it, but we can't see it. It gives rise to intense attachment to get what I want, intense aversion and panic and fear when I don't, and all the other dramas that come. And then all the uh, harm we do on the basis of it. I mean, look at when we're f driven by rage and attachment. Look at what humans do to each other. Bad enough, you know. We go mad. We lose our minds. All of this is driven by this root misconception deep in the bones of our being. So basically the words for it, like, it gets very confusing, but the words for it, the, the, Buddha's te the Buddha's teaching, the Tsongkhapa, our 14th century lineage lama, always says the best way to really understand how that fantasy I that we believe is in there somewhere, how it really doesn't exist. And the shorthand for that, as we know in the literature, the shorthand is this word emptiness, which of course completely throws us because we hear it as if, because the words are, the Buddha's telling us that actually deep in the bones of our being, when we start to do the analysis and the meditating, we are not going to find this special little kind of boss part of me called I that runs the show. We're not going to find that. This sounds hilarious to us. So we hear, therefore there's no I. And then we think, okay, now I'm going to chuck the baby out of the bathwater. I don't exist. Might as well kill myself. That's the misconception. We, we go too far. So the way to understand this emptiness, as they call it, and this word does throw us, is to think about it in the framework of what does exist, how things do exist. This is called dependent arising. They call them the two truths. So everything does have existence. There is a flower, there is a computer, there is a person, there is you know, a, a stove, a paper, a cup, whatever. The world full of sort of millions of phenomena. So let's a little bit look at the analysis and of this particular phenomenon. This thing, we're, we're called a person. We're I, we're self, me, person. All these words refer to the same thing. We're one of that type of phenomena. We're not a cup, we're not a toilet, we're not a lamp. We're not a thermos. We're a person. So what is this, this deeper analysis of how things exist finally, how things exist ultimately? When we've got this, Buddha says, this is when we've achieved liberation. When we've cut this and then perfected this understanding, what we've done is we've cut all these lies from the mind. We've cut all the misconceptions. We now are in sync with how things exist. And therefore fear has gone. The delusions have gone. There's a sense of incredible, I mean, you can't even describe the qualities of a person who would have achieved their own nirvana. This is what we're talking about. Not some place. It's the word you can use to refer to the, per the mind of the person who's done this job. First controlling their body and speech, then controlling their mind, unpacking, unraveling, unpacking, unraveling. Then you get to the compassion wing and you develop this amazing body teacher, this compassion. And within that framework, then every day in your meditation, you do this one of getting concentration meditation. And then on the basis of this, you do the unpacking and unraveling at the deepest level. And finally, you get to see nakedly for the first time. There never has been isn't and never could be this fantasy, concrete, solid, real, pointable, separate, bereft, fear-based me. I mean, these words are pretty abstract for us, you know. So let's look a bit of the analysis we could do to look into this, even intellectually. 
So again, Buddha's saying nothing that exists exists intrinsically. There's no intrinsic character of anything in anything. Again, I have to keep saying it, uh, qualifying. These words, if we haven't thought about them, haven't looked into the Buddhist literature, of course they're completely weird. It's like hearing about math and you've never, or hearing about physics if you've never learned physics. It's obvious, you know. So he's saying that we, this deep primordial ego grasping within us, this misconception, is why we believe this is intrinsic, separate me. This is why we create karma. This is why we have attachment and anger and jealousy and pride. And why we keep bumping into each other life after life, as well as the good things. And so we can cut this cycle. By adding the compassion wing to it as well, then you, 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 know, you can get to the point where you don't need to come back in this crazy life, but you will want to because you want to benefit others. That's the compassion attitude. So let, you know, there's two parts. There's two wings of the bird, wisdom, and compassion. So here we want to perfect the wisdom wing, and that gets done in our meditation every day. Once we've got single-pointed concentration. So these, let's look at first of all what single-pointed concentration means. Is this a because that you can't do this job? And Lama Yeshi talks about this in Mahamudra. You can't do this job unless you've got single-pointed concentration. You know which is this subtle level of mind that we don't even posit as existing in modern psychology or neuroscience that is beyond conceptual, beyond sensory, not just some mystical thing that you might taste occasionally, you know? Not like that. It's a very rigorous, clear system that enables you to get to that level of mind. Then when you've got that subtle level, the, the bliss is the bonus, the joy, the clarity, they're the bonus. But the reason you want it is so that you can go to the second mode of meditation and get insight into how this I actually exists. This is this book of Lama's. I mean, Lama teaches it so easily, so sweetly, you know. Mahamudra, How to Discover Our True Nature, published by Wisdom. Came out last year, I think. So concentration... Okay, it's described, as I said, in terms of nine stages of cultivation. And it's this, what it is, is this, you know, um, it's this, we know, we know ourselves, if we sit down to even meditate, even roughly a little bit of meditation, there are two main dangers, two main obstacles to getting some focus. Either your mind gets overexcited, all the chatting never stops, or you become, the mind becomes very dull and spaced out. This is more of a danger, really, because when we get... Some people can sit down very comfortably and feel very relaxed and very peaceful in their meditation. And, that, and that's nice. It feels very good. But often that's simply the mind spacing out because it feels nice. But this is absolutely not a characteristic of concentration. To get concentration you, it's a really refined thing, a clear understanding of how when you're practicing it, bringing your mind away from the, all the over chatty, 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 and also bringing your mind out of the danger of becoming sinking into some pleasant feeling. Many people you know, can mistake feeling good, feeling pleasant, feeling comfortable with concentration. No, it's just spacing out. So we need to understand this really carefully by reading the instructions and having a good teacher and who knows what they're talking about, you know. So concentration then is not that easy because, you know, the main, the main problem for most of us is the mind never stops. It's this berserk chatting away, you know. So it's a really interesting, but it's a practice we can start every day. It doesn't mean we have, we're not going to achieve it necessarily, but we're going to, we want to try and do it every day. And in Mahamuda meditation, the thing you focus on is not your breath, is not just sitting there, but it's focusing specifically on whatever arises in your mind. Eventually, when the mind is beginning to become stable, then you, the focus, what you're focusing on is the clarity of your mind. And itself is a very nice little meditation to do. In other words, one of the key ways of doing this is very simply, you know how even in day-to-day -day life you try this as well, we can see that when thoughts arise, what we do is we, lo we, we leap into the thoughts and we start completely getting involved in the conversation and we become mindless, we're totally unconscious and we spend all day doing this, talking to ourselves, back even behind doing the dishes and whatever, we're just this gripped in these conversations. This is why I get so exhausted and unhappy. Whereas one of the practices, and this is what Mahamudra at the very beginning is, we can do it in daily life, where you can sit there and just allow the thoughts 
to do what they want because they're so compulsive they're all there but to make this conscious effort not to engage in them this is like a miracle every time we engage in the thoughts it's like you're putting oil on the fire you know but if you allow the thoughts to come and it's pretty scary because we can't stand our thoughts especially if you're angry upset we buy into them we, we listen to them we argue with them and then we believe this is me this is such a powerful practice just allow the thoughts to come and go don't want them to go away one of the misconceptions about meditation is you think you're supposed to make the thoughts go away but a major practice is allow the thoughts to be there they're all these compulsive old habits in the mind they can't stop you know you're just chatting 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 but you don't buy into them a part of your mind your attention you just pay attention and let the thoughts come and go this is a profoundly marvelous practice this can keep us steady you know and then during our life as well in the daytime so concentration is the first mode then you use that in the second mode to try and investigate and you know and Lama talks about this but let's look into try and analyze a little bit um, what time is it oh three minutes to go no no I've got another hour haven't I another hour oh, yeah good mm -hmm. yep yeah. Yep. Okay. My God, so much time. Okay, good. Fantastic. So um, let's do a bit of analysis now to try and use logic. This is, see, there's different levels of mind. We've got the intellectual level and then we have a, a non-intellectual level. But we can use the intellectual to get us to the non-intellectual. That's what's so powerful. So let's just do that here. Mahamud is different. It's a whole different style. But this is using the conceptual as a stepping stone to the non-conceptual. Just like you have to learn a recipe really precisely in order to get the delicious cake. You've got to learn, you've got to squeeze your brain to learn the complexity of Bach's musical theory. You can't sit and play Bach without squeezing your brain first. This we get. Same here. So let's squeeze our brains a bit. The Buddha is saying for so long, we've been clinging, this ego grasping in deep inside us assumes the existence of a real, solid, separate little piece in here, walking hand in hand with all the other pieces, as my friend Pende says, you know, we know we've got an ear, we've got an eye, we've got a, an anger, we've got love, we've got kindness, we've got ligaments, we've got muscles, we've got knees. If you broke down yourself into, you'd be made of millions of parts. So this particular view of dependent arising that Buddha talks about is that we really believe that in here somewhere, there is a very special part that runs the show and that part is called I, me. So we say these words and we go, well, yeah, of course. Of course it's a me. What are you talking about? No, he says we've got to do some really subtle analysis because he says we're overstating the actual ontological status of me. We're actually overstating. One of the clear functions of all the delusions is they overestate things. They embellish. They exaggerate. So attachment for the cake is a thought in your mind, a view in your mind that makes the cake look way more delicious than it really is. So that attachment is a branch of the root delusion that believes just like it does about me, but in this case it's the cake, that believes underneath somehow that this deliciousness, this ignorance in the mind, this marikpa, this ignorance, this root delusion in relation to the cake, the attachment in my mind believes it's more delicious than it is. And the ignorance which informs that attachment causes the cake, the delicious cake, to appear to me as existing out there in itself out there in itself I'm just this innocent victim that's a function of ignorance it sees everything as having an intrinsic nature so that's how we think about ourselves as well we don't realize we do this so the Buddha, one of this first argument this first analysis we have to do one of the first analyses we have to do and this is done when you really study it in more depth and you're meditating every day you do these analyses that are much you know you have a lot of background like I said to you know it's about the mind you have this model now just cross your fingers and hope for the best. So, let's do a bit of analysis here. We say the words, I have a nose. I 
have pain. I have anger. My anger does this. My jealousy does that. So the, the central player in our head is the word I, isn't it? We can see that. The central, per, the word in our mind is me or I or mine. It's a very big word for us. But the Buddha's saying that we never analyze what is it that we're referring to when we say I. If we say ear, if you say, I say to you, I have an ear. If I say to you, I have a thermos. As soon as you hear those words, you will use with your eyes, you'll look into where the sound is coming from. You'll recognize the word thermos and you'll observe this shape and color. We all know we call it thermos. <coughs> and you'll recognize the other thing, which is based on the, 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 the referent object of the word I is rabina. So then you, there's two things there, a thermos and a rabina. That's pretty straightforward, that's pretty, that's pretty logical. So because they say this one, this type of analysis is, you know, if you say <coughs> if there's, there's either one thing or there's more than one. So here there's two. And if there are two things, if there are two things, you have to see that the thermos is one of them and the rabin is another. They can't be the same. You've got to separate them and you can't see that they don't depend on each other. Rabina could grow up dead. The thermos is fine. The thermos could break, Rabina is fine. So in the simple sense of a simple way that things exist, there are two phenomena there, each of which is separate and independent. That's an easy example. Now, I say to you something that will get more subtle. I say to you, I have an ear. And without analysis, you will look at me and you will agree that the Rabina does have an ear. No analysis. That is a, a true statement. But the Buddha is saying this. We have to analyze because when we say, I have an ear, check out that. How many phenomena is that? How many nouns? It's two, isn't it? One is called I, a pronoun, Rabina, and one is called ear. So in the same way that before, if I say, I have a thermos, we have to point out the I, but separate from the thermos. And we can do it. But so we have a feeling that in here there is a little piece called I that sort of is the boss that runs all the parts. So we feel that that word I does refer to something very specific. The Buddhists, the, the Hindus call it an Atman, a self. The Christians call it a soul. The Greeks call it an essence. Buddha says, no, there isn't such a thing. And he's not saying there's no I, his view of what I is is different, but it's not an isolated, separate, independent I. Because if there were, this sounds really hilarious, would you listen to this? In the same way that you can say there's two phenomena here, Rabina and Thermos. And if Thermos breaks, because it doesn't depend upon Rabina for its existence, no, because Rabina doesn't depend upon her existence for a Thermos, it won't affect her. Rabina watches and go, oh, poor Thermos, it's just fell on the floor. I'm okay, though. Now, if there were a piece in here that is separate, and the Christians say it's called a soul, the, the, the Hindus say it is a special intrinsic thing called a self. If there were a special piece that's labelled I or me or whatever you like, our words say it. If there were a separate piece called I, along with the nose and the ear and the glasses, no, and the fingers and the ligaments and the, and the anger and the love, all the millions of bits of I, if there were a special piece in there, this is how we think that kind of runs the show, the sort of the puppeteer, that is separate from the other pieces, in the same way that a nose and an ear are separate, I have a nose and an ear. So that's easy. There's ear, there's nose. If ear hurts, nose, like the thermos breaking, the nose is looking on and going, oh, phew, I'm glad it's not me. I'm fine. The, ear, the nose is untouched. The nose can still blow snot when the ear is hurt. And the nose does not feel pain when there's pain in the ear because they're separate and independent in the simplest sense. Now, what about the third component called I? So when, when, when you know, when, when, uh, when Margot says, oh, Rabina, your nose is so ugly. And I'll say, how dare you insult me? And Margot will say, no, I didn't insult you, Rabina. I insulted your nose. I mean, this sounds like playing games, right? But this is logic. 
because we assume there is a piece of solution around here somewhere. There's this, I mean, it's so inarticulate for us. No wonder her sis has her existential fears because she's beginning to trigger the belief in this eye that Buddha says doesn't exist, so there's nothing to fear. You'll never disappear. So we, and this is just, this is why, because we have to have single point of concentration because this assumption of an eye that's separate and independent that runs the show is so primordial, so ancient. It, at a gross level, we can begin to comprehend intellectually, but we've got to get the, in order to get the experience of it, you can only do it with a subtle level of the mind, only do it with like the microscope of your mind. But we've got to start with the intellectual. So if there were a separate piece called I in here, when Margot insults Rabina's nose, the piece called I will be going, oh, phew, I'm glad it's not insulting me. The I would be untouched, just like the thermos in Rabina. This is, sounds so silly to us. This is a type of analysis we have to do. But we so implicitly believe when we say I. But there's two mistakes. We think either there is this special separate piece that runs the show, the boss, the puppeteer, or, and that's the first argument we're having here, we're having this discussion now. We'll go to the other one in a minute. This is logical thinking, but it just sounds like hilarious to us. So what we're trying to do in this type of analysis, which we then do in meditation, is to unpack and unravel these deep, misconceptions that, list, that exist at the level of primordial assumption that Buddha is saying are the root of all our suffering. So we start by controlling the servants of the crazy delusions, then we start by working on the grosser delusions, and now we're starting working on the subtlest one. It's one step at a time, you know, unpacking and unraveling these misconceptions in our mind. And when we have done that, as Lama Yeshi says, when we've realized that that I, this fantasy I, has never, doesn't, and can never exist, he says, then there is no fear. The mind is blissful. Therefore, you've got no attachment, no anger, and all the rest, all gone. Because there's no longer a basis. So there's many misconceptions, many major mistakes when we think this. Because Buddha isn't saying there is no I. It's just that it's more nuanced. Not that the I is very tiny. The, the, the interpretation of what I refers to is more nuanced and more subtle than we can think, you know. So it's not as if there's no I. And as His Holiness says, the I isn't empty of existing from its own side. Because you can't find it. You won't find one. That's not the real premise. The I is empty of existing intrinsically because it's a dependent arising. That's the, that's the real thinking. That's the, when we've got the final understanding. These are just some words, you people. Of course, it's subtle. It's fascinating. We can be very fascinated intellectually by it, which is a good start. But then we have to turn it into experience in our meditation by knowing what this is. And so it, this, this, clar this kind of clarity of thoughts leads to the taste. Like the more clear you are about Bach's musical theory, the more likely you get the experience of playing it on the piano. It's not just wishy-washy and vague and cross your fingers and put your hands on the piano and hope Bach will come out of you. It doesn't work like that. So the other misconception we have is that the I is all of me. This is, all, this is another feeling we have strongly. This is all of me. I is all of me. That's not true either, Buddha says, when you do the subtle analysis. So we'll say, well, my mind is my I and my body is my I. But let's first look at what an I is. Conventionally speaking, the label Margo, or I, in her case, is the term we use to refer to her bits and pieces. Margo is a label we use to refer to the combination of Margo's mind and Margo's body. So Margo is a label we use to refer to the package made up of body and mind. 
So the pieces of mago, the pieces of I, are body and mind. But then she'll say, well, I'm my body. My mind is my body. My mind is my I. Well, if the mind is also I, and if they're synonymous, then you wouldn't be able to separate I from the mind. You'd, you'd be one thing. So why would you say, I have a mind? That's schizophrenic. If you say, I am the body, it's the same argument. And anyway, if you define what an I is, Margo is a name we give to the combination of her body and her mind, then you can't say that the body is Margo. We just said Margo is a combination of both. So you can't have it both ways. The base can't be the label. This is a massive one. And this seems initially kind of boring, intellectual and meaningless. But it's a subtle analysis you have to do to find the mistake, you know. And through on the basis of concentration, you then th you have your concentration. You go to the second mode. You've non you've you've listened. You've thought these words through. You've been analysing, analysing. And when you get concentration, you then contemplate this at a more subtle level, and then it will trigger the insight. And you hold that insight of the taste of it. You know. So what's the point of all this? Is to stop suffering. Because the belief in this intrinsic me and intrinsic cake and intrinsic everything else, the Buddha says, is the source of all suffering in all the universes since beginningless time. This is what, so samsara has been caught up in the nonsense and getting your nirvana is being chucking out the nonsense and no longer, and realizing that never has been, isn't and never could be that intrinsic I, intrinsic anything else. So of course it's a subtle analysis and it's easily able, easily can be mistaken. One of the major misconceptions in much of the literature is the assumption that when you say there's no intrinsic I, we chuck the baby out with the bathwater and think there's no I. And that's, that's nihilism, that's nihilism. It's just, it's too, it's, you chucked out too much. You fall into the abyss of the great mistake, Tsongkhapa says. Then the other extreme, you see, all this is done in the context of the two truths. There's conventional reality and then there's ultimate. And these actually, we see them as separate. So as soon as we hear emptiness, we hear nothingness. Then as soon as, as, soon as we see a dependent arising, which is the shorthand for how things do exist, then we, over, we, we exaggerate the status of something and we grasp at it. So that's over-exaggeration and this is under-exaggeration. And we swing between these two misconceptions all the time. So we need to bring these two truths together. So when we can begin to realize that when we say that something has no intrinsic nature, we think, ha ha, that means it does exist as a dependent arising. Things exist in dependence upon causes, things exist in dependence upon their parts, and finally things exist in dependence upon the mind labeling them that that's the three levels of dependent arising. So when we can understand that something exists in dependence upon something, it tells us that it's empty of existing independently. Whereas we hear these as opposite right now. We're on the right track when we can hear these as referring to the same thing, flip sides of the same coin. So we just, is this why it's good to know if we do want the Buddhist model, let's get, get the right sources, get the good teachings, read His Holiness, read the, your own teachers, read the literature, there's lots of people who have lots of views about it, so select who you read, obviously, you know, and then you just think about it, analyze it, study it, meditate on it. And slowly, slowly, we're chipping away at these misconceptions. We're chipping away at attachment. We're chipping away at aversion. We're chipping away at this ego grasping. And what is the consequence of that? More space, more comfort, more confidence, more contentment, therefore more joy, therefore more kindness, therefore more love, you know. Any questions so far? We'll keep talking. No. Okay. Don't know if we keep talking for 45 minutes about this. We can, but maybe we're going to ask other questions. Got any questions about anything else? Any questions about anything else? No. Maybe we should talk about the compassion wing as well. It's not part of getting out of samsara and nirvana, but it's a good topic. 
and this all this is part of the whole integrated whole and that all of which all these different parts help us each help each other you know so you've got the wisdom wing and the compassion wing we've been talking basically the wisdom wing but when we combine this with the compassion wing then it becomes really powerful so the wisdom wing is working on yourself the nuts and bolts of how your mind works controlling your behavior controlling your mind understanding this model doing your meditation every day deconstructing 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 the nonsense getting clearer and clearer the consequence for ourselves of this as i said before is more clarity more joy less neurosis more stability more confidence more love more compassion there's no question but we can add to the compassion we can we can we can enhance compassion and love and that's the work of the compassion wing so the job we're doing from beginning to end is working on our mind reformulating reinterpreting the universe we're using buddha's view here that's about my you know it's our choice we're using that as our as our reference point for how things exist so one of the consequences of ego grasping this root delusion is in relation to ourself is more attachment to get what i want more panic when i don't and all the other dramas come and that's the nature of our suffering so it causes us to be unhappy delusional fears dramas but the other function is there evident isn't it as lama yeshi says in mahamudra the very positing of a separate me implies other so the more strong we grasp at me the more others out there aren't they you know so the way of looking into the compassion wing is then we start to chip away at those misconceptions that have literally constructed other so how do we describe others we describe them in three categories this is the whole universe and again this is rooted in the buddhist analysis of the mind that talks about these three poisons these three toxic emotions which are the summary of all the other neurotic emotions ego grasping or or ignorance attachment and aversion or anger so we can see we see the entire this is the compassion wing now we can see the entire world through the lenses of these three the type all the beings so who are they the objects of attachment we call friend the object of aversion we can call enemy you might not use that word but it's a good label and the third category which is the function of this ego grasping which is a particular function of of of, un, of uncaring couldn't care less who are they that's the strangers so we have as attachment you have your beloveds your your enemies the ones we don't like the ones who annoy you upset you who harmed you cheated on you you might use the word enemy but they they that that category you see them through the lenses of your aversion and the third category which is 99.999% of the universe we call them strangers don't we so how do we feel about the friend we adore them full of love and compassion so we do have love and compassion they're virtues but only for that category usually so in other words our, our love and compassion now are contingent upon attachment unstable as lama zoba says as long as you do what my attachment wants and it sounds brutal but look at our lives look at the world as long as my beloved boyfriend is kind and loving and beloved to me and does what i want and is sweet and i mean nothing wrong with that it's marvelous to be sweet and kind but look at the attachment when my attachment starts not getting what it wants from him he starts cheating on me being mean to me my attachment is not getting what he wants so what will happen to my love and compassion that it'll turn off like a tap and before you know it i've chucked him out and he's now in the enemy category So a a friend by definition in this framework is 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 a person who doesn't my attachment wants. An enemy by definition is a person who doesn't do what my attachment wants or does what my attachment doesn't want. It sounds kind of brutal, but this is the analysis. And if you analyze people yourself, it we, we can see it. The third category, 99.99% of the universe they are literally are called strangers so what definition of a stranger think about it is a person who neither harms you nor helps you they do neither so we have complete indifference this is so normal i mean if we understand this we should be rather embarrassed at how self-centered we are because we all monkeys and dogs and ants as well we all have the three poisons buddha says so we all have attachment aversion and ignorance so we see every being in the universe there's no fourth category there are the ones who suit your attachment 
then you're prepared to have love and compassion for them because they're doing what your attachment wants. They're your close people, your beloveds, your babies, your friends, you know, whatever. Then you have your enemies. I mean, again, I don't use the word, but listen to it. The ones you don't like, who harm you, who've got the wrong politics, who do bad things, who've harmed you personally, harmed your friends, your, you know, whatever, this group who don't agree with your attachment, who do what your attachment doesn't want. So you have aversion for them. And then we have indifference, complete and utter indifference for the third category. So this first level of practice in the compassion wing, this series of techniques that we do that culminate in this outrageous paradigm shift in the mind that we can call bodhicitta, which is not the equivalent of love and compassion, but it's the culmination of love and compassion. This outrageous attitude when you've got it not just moments of it, when it's actual, stable, then from that moment you no longer think of I, you only think of others, you're like, everybody in the universe is like your most precious child. This is real stuff, but it takes a while to get there, my goodness. Then there's body cheating. You only want to benefit others and you never give up life after life after life after life, working on yourself so you can become a Buddha, because then you're super qualified to be a benefit to everybody, you know. So all this series of techniques that get us to that one. But this foundation practice called the practice of equanimity, this is a particular one, where we start to logically analyze how the way we see these, the way we've projected, the way we've made up these three categories has no basis in reality. So it is true that your friend is a beloved to you. They do are kind to you. And it is true the husband did cheat on you. They're facts. And it is true the stranger has done neither. But this is the point about equanimity. We're trying to establish. Right now, ego's view is, I love those who are friendly to me. I don't love those who aren't, and I couldn't care about the rest. That's ego's analysis. But it's it's just too self-centered. The thing we're trying to get to see, equanimity is this kind of heartfelt recognition that friend, enemy, and stranger are equal to each other from just one point of view. They each want to be happy and they each don't want to suffer. So we're trying to we're trying to see the scientific truth of this. That's some emotional thing, you know. There's plenty of logic to prove it. One really good analysis I like to do, think of this one. Oh, sorry, before I say that, how we think now is we only want to adore and be compassionate and love our friend because there's a close connection there. We've got the karmic history with this person. They are a beloved. There's nothing wrong with having beloveds. But the point is this, my love and compassion for their beloved are contingent on their continuing to do what my attachment wants. Pretty much, look at the world, you know. So what we're trying to do here is get ourselves out of the equation and see the friend as a separate person from me. Stop seeing them through your lenses, which is what we do to the entire universe. We see them all these beings through the lenses of my needs, which is attachment. If they fulfill them, they're called friend. If they actively don't, they're called enemy. If they do neither, they're called stranger. And we don't question this. We don't question this analysis. This is the universe. So here we're trying to get ourselves out of the equation and try to get to see these three people as separate from me. As separate. So to to get to see the truth that from their point of view, whether they're a murderer or a meditator, whether, whether they're mean to you or not has got nothing to do with it. We're trying to get ourselves out of the equation and we're trying to observe scientifically and factually that each of these people are equal to each other from this one point of view. They are driven by the wish every second to be happy and they are driven by the wish every second to not suffer. This is something almost like primordial. It's a fact, you know. It's not good, it's not bad, it's just the way it is. This is so fundamental. So why do we want to see this? Because we're trying to shift the logical reason. Well, ego's got no logic. We're trying to shift the reason we, from the reason why now I love somebody. And what is love? This is the point. What is love? May you be happy. What is compassion? May you not suffer. 
So right now I have those thoughts only for beloveds. So I'm trying to have it for everybody. But we've got to start with this recognition that the reason that I've got to see logically that they all want to be happy. And from that perspective, there's no difference. And that becomes the basis of eventually wanting all of them to be happy and wanting all of them not to suffer, which is the development of love and compassion, which is in this series of 11 techniques in the Lam Rim text. It's, about the set, it's almost like the end. You know, We do all these little techniques, meditating step by step by step, leading to this. But the basis has to be this recognition that they're equal from the point of view of each wanting to be happy and not suffer. And this is enormous already. I mean, you know, if you've got your ex-husband and he broke your heart, and they do, people break each other's hearts. People harm each other all the time. You know, your husband did harm you. He was mean. Nobody's arguing with that. And if I still haven't got over the pain yet, and I hear that my husband wants to be happy just like my present, my, my past ugly husband wants to be happy in exactly the same way as my present divine husband does, my first response will be, what do you mean he wants to be happy? He doesn't deserve it. This is huge in our mind. So we've got to unpack what that means. It's got nothing to do with deserving because that's all in reference to my attachment, getting what I need, my self-centeredness. This is really tough stuff, you know. We're not trying to get a gooey feeling. We're trying to see the logic. It's true that all beings are driven by the wish to be happy and not suffer. That's what we're trying. To, that's the meaning of equanimity here. It's very, very simple. But wow, to unpack it, not easy. So how do you practice in the daily life? And, and it's upon this that we then develop all the other ten points that culminate in bodhicitta. This is the first one, the foundation. Get this clear first. Then we gradually grow this wish to make them happy, which is love, and the wish to take them from suffering, which is compassion. There's about 11 little techniques that get you there, you know. This is the basis. Because as I said, we do have love, may you be happy. And we do have compassion, may you not suffer. But usually for that first group only. And then we don't have it for the meanies, because we think they don't deserve it. Why does it mean deserve it? They haven't been kind to me. So it's very self-centered. That next husband is very kind to his, his new wife. We know that, but we can't bear to hear about that. If he's been mean to me, he doesn't deserve my love. If he's been, you know, and this is the logic we're using. We're trying to break down this logic, which is really intense. It's not comfortable. Any questions on that? No? Nothing? Yes, good. Talk to me, Catherine. It's not a question about compassion, okay. but it's. All right. Um, I've I, I've been absolutely fascinated with everything you've said, and it is really deep oh, thinking. Awesome. It's Miranda. Good. I thought it was Catherine. Miranda. Good yeah. Go on. Talk to me. Yeah. So you need to really concentrate and focus and do some work. However, not everybody on this planet is able to thinking this way that's right Miranda exactly how how are they to achieve um how are they able to manage their suffering how are they able darling. to get out exactly. of this Miranda I understand and this is what's heartbreaking so this is where the two wings of the bird come in this is the wisdom wing. This is kind of like, it's as if you kind of were talking nutrition here, but of course we're talking mental nutrition. So we've got systems. I mean, we know nutrition exists out there. We know there are methods. So now, but we also know the vast majority of people, this is easy to see, don't know anything about nutrition. So they're obese, they're overweight, they're sick, they've got diseases and they haven't got a clue. It's a really simple, obvious analogy. Would you not agree? So what's, so the first step is you go, oh my God, all these, so first of all, you didn't know either. You didn't know about nutrition. Suddenly you're learning nutrition now and it's a revelation to you that you've got methods to help yourself get healthy. And then you think, what about all these other people? They don't know about it. This is where compassion comes in, darling. You've got to have the wisdom yourself. You've got to know how to do it. And then you have this, this is what a bodhisattva is, you have this powerful wish, I have to do it. If I don't get out there and help all those people, and you do it life after life after life with incredible enthusiasm, helping any individual being as much as you can, one step at a time. That's the power of this amazing attitude of bodhicitta. You've got to have this enthusiasm based on the wisdom. 
the more wisdom you have about how to fix your mind, the more you know how suffering is, the more, and then you, you out of your genuine, more and more you get compassion for others. Because the more you see your own suffering, you never looked at nutrition before. You didn't even know what ill health was. You just knew you had headaches and overweight and blah. Now you have the knowledge. And now you look at the world. Oh my God, we're all in the same boat. And it's, instead of just criticizing or whatever, or I don't care, the more you work on yourself, the more wisdom you get, the more courage you get, the more confident you get, then you do the compassion then it's my job. That's the energy of Bodhicitta. Look at his holiness. I mean, he looks like a regular person. He makes sure he acts like a normal person. He hasn't stopped for 70 years trying to change the whole damn world. And that's coming from his own wisdom. But he's never fun. He's funny. He cracks jokes. He's not angry. He just never gives up, you know. That's what the Bodhisattvas are like. Do you understand my point? That's the point, sweetheart. Yeah. It's a big, tough one. It's like everybody in the universe is your child and you're the mother and it's your job, baby. That's bodhisattvas. But you can't just have compassion. It's not enough. You've got to have the wisdom, which gives you the ground and the methodology to know how to help others. Do you understand? Perfect question, Miranda. That's the answer, darling. What else, people? Uh, I think Catherine had her hand up. Catherine? Good, Catherine. Yes, exactly. Thank you. Good, darling. I hope this isn't too off the wall but don't it's worry been please go on me. just say um, it go on <laughs> <laughs> um am i affected is my karma affected by the actions of my ancestors no it's interesting because enough. yeah i understand good because oh. uh, i mean for example i have a, a an ancestor from a couple of hundred years ago who was a nasty piece of work he was so <laughs> violent and sadistic yes, and right. you know <laughs> yeah i understand i also have ancestors it's not that my family are important or anything it's just that i grew up I with lots of stories of family members i also exactly. have some lovely ancestors exactly. is, is there any kind of direct yeah. effect how much do we inherit yeah. from our none ancestors of it. none of it not a fraction this is no, the point. This is the good. point. Yeah, I know, it is. Because the point is, um, this is a very interesting point. This is a really good point, actually. So there we are, identifying as, in your, what's, your, you know, what's your family, say your family's name is, whatever is it, there you are. Sc not Scotland, let's say it's Smith. I don't care what your name is, it doesn't matter. So we naturally all, we identify with whatever group, you know, in this particular life, whether we're a woman, whether we're black, whether we're a musician, we've got groups. We love identifying with groups. And one of those groups mm. is a family one, which is quite strong. So of course, because of the, the philosophical materialist presentation of reality, and I've been critical, I'm just looking at it, the neuroscientific view, the psychological view, which absolutely um, says that we are only the physical and that we are to that Catherine is totally made by her parents, that she inherits love, compassion, psychosis and generosity and being good at tennis from <coughs> mummy, from daddy in the genes and the DNA and the blah and you go back and back to your, to your wicked people. That's absolutely the materialist view. So from that perspective, yes, you do inherit. But for the Buddha's view, not at all. This is a fundamental point in Buddhism. We've got to think it through. That your body, no problem, you get from your mummy and daddy. But your mind, Catherine, you could have been a Tibetan man in the last life, in another country altogether. You could have been an Australian Aboriginal, for God's sake. You know, you didn't come, you didn't get reborn out of your family. You got reborn from somewhere completely different. You could have been a dog in a past life. So you bring your stuff into this family. So the genes play a role. So in other words, if you've got strong karma to be really healthy, you got you got strong karma from no killing in the past. You've lived in vows of no killing, honey child. You will definitely get born to a mummy who's got no bad genes, ex, no tendency to get cancer, best heart. You'll get born in a really good house because you created the cause to have that mummy. Now, if you've got killing karma due to past lives in whatever life you were, you're going to get born to a mummy who's got a tendency to get cancer. You so you get the genes from your mother, but the court, the fact that you go to that mother that comes from your past karma and your mind so you cannot inherit qualities from a mother does not give you any anger any love any kindness you bring those with you you can even share those with your mother so let's say you're a <coughs> let's say you've got a kind of a nazi mind you'll get born to a nazi mother i promise you you know my <laughs> mother my mother was a, a, a classical musician so when they, she saw her little Bobsy, that's me, she said, oh, rabina has got tendency to be good at music. So she taught me. I became a, she taught me singing. So everybody would say, of course, Rabina got her singing from her mummy. No, she didn't. My mother was good at music, so she brought it with her into this life. I must have been good at music, so I brought it into my life. And I conveniently got born to a good musician mummy, so she nourished my music. But my music, my love, my hate, my, they are mine. I bring those with me. This is the crucial point from the starting point to understand karma. So we can't inherit, inherit 
but you can share those negative qualities. Just as, like if you're, you're born into a long line of Nazis, well, of course you share them with your ancestors, but you didn't get them from your ancestors. That's the big okay. difference. Which is the point, you understand? Okay. And then Thank we, you. Can, we can see that psychotic parents give, give birth to nice children, and nice children, we, psychotic children have nice parents. That's why it's always a puzzle for us. We don't understand. I always remember, you remember the Columbine kids 20, 23, several years ago in America, that massive shooting of the children's one, and these two young kids, you know, like kind of, and they made a video, and you could see they were just paranoid, and this weird white supremacist views, and everybody was freaked out about these two boys and how they killed all those children. So, of course, we think they came from the parents, and we think the blame is the parents. And I know two things about this. They, so they had to go and dig up the brains of these boys to see where the link was. But you're not going to find the cause in the brain, Buddha says, because these kids brought this stuff with them. And the other aspect was this. These parents, the first thing people think is the parents must be monsters. So they looked into these parents. They were nice white Christians. They didn't do anything wrong. So we don't understand that because we are convinced it has to come from the parents. We can't find an explanation. So this woman, one of the, one of the mothers, who she said it was. She wrote a memoir after twenty years of it. It was. She can see. You can see she was shattered completely. First of all, if you have this view, you think you're the blame. Everybody else blames you. It destroyed her marriage. She kind of lost her lost her mental health. This whole idea of what did she do wrong? How come? What you know? Because we believe that children are made by the parents. It's a very powerful view, you know. So when we understand the view of karma. Of course, the family play a role, but our mind, our tendencies, our love, our hate, our sainthood, our psychosis, we bring them with us. We can share them with mummy and daddy, but we don't get them from mummy and daddy. That's the crucial point about karma, Catherine. Okay? Thank you. Okay, darling. And I had a good mummy and daddy, by the way. Well, you're very <laughs> fortunate. That's it. You created the cause. You, we get the mummy and daddy we deserve. Good on you, girl. What, anybody else? Any other questions? We've got another yeah, Mark, time. Mark has a question. Good, Mark. Yeah, uh, yeah. I have yes. a question, Robina. Yes. What, is, what are your thoughts about karma in relation to the COVID-19 pandemic? That well, at the I, moment I can, affects... I, don't, I, don't, I can't give you my thoughts. I'll give you Buddha's analysis. All I know is Buddhist views, and I can tell you Buddhist views. Yeah, I'll then tell, please. I'll tell you exactly. There are, as I said before, there are four ways in this... We look into our life now, we can divide into four areas the way our past actions are ripening in the present. So, one is our type of rebirth. So we've got a human birth, so that's the fruit mark of all of us here and everybody else is human. That's the fruit of one of our main bank vault seeds of non-killing that is, was triggered before we stopped breathing, so we got a human mummy. So that's the fruit of non-killing, getting a human birth. The second way our karma ripens is a tendency. So we can see the human world, lots of people have a tendency to not to, to, to kill, don't they? Do you agree? One of, the, one of the karmic results of killing is to have the tendency to kill. Look at humans. Most humans kill something. So that's the fruit of killing, a tendency to keep doing it. You with me so far? The yes. next level is called experiences similar to the cause. So in terms of killing, anybody who dies young, anything from a fetus, you know, dying young, your life is cut short, or you are actually killed by others. That is the kind of karma called experience similar to the cause of your past killing. Now, lots of people with COVID-19 are experiencing that one. Wouldn't you agree? Yes. So that's the cause for them is their past killing. Now, the next one is called environmental karma, and this means the very way the physical world impacts upon us. So let's look at our environment. It doesn't mean like we talk about the word, word environmental. It means it, your outside world, the world you live in. So if your environment is your house. Your environment for you is the people in your house. Your environment is the air, the water, everything out there, and how it impacts upon you, that's the fruit of your actions as well. Now look at COVID-19. The result of killing from the point of view of environmental karma is that the physical world itself actually is harming you. So you've got allergies, let's say a peanut can kill you, right? That's the fruit of your past killing. If the water's polluted, the air's polluted. Now look at COVID-19. People, our grandma, our grandpa, human beings 
are poison for us now. We can't even kiss each other. We have to wear masks. So that's the karmic result environmentally of the entire world now. Billions of us experiencing the environmental result of past killing. So environmental karma takes thousands of lives to bring the result. It's the most expansive type of karma. So then equally we can see some of us are not getting sick we don't ever get COVID-19, so that means we don't have the karmic result. We're living in a general environment, so we've got to be careful. You know, the air could be polluted here, could be poison food there, or that person over there might have COVID-19. But if you don't get sick and you don't get COVID-19, that means you, you don't have the karma of killing. But you've got to be careful. So we're all sharing this karmic result of non-killing. The fact that other humans now are like poison for us. So that's the environmental result of past killing. If you get COVID-19 and die young, that's the result of... Um, just getting sick is environmental karma. Dying young or di getting killed by others, that's the experience similar to the cause karma. Are we communicating? Yes. Yes. In so a, it's basically a mass ripening of environmental past karma. Past killing karma and ca killing. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And from a th thousands of lives ago, you know, because yeah. it affects the whole world. And you can see environmental karma is very, it's not, it can be personal. You can live in an environment with everybody else and the food is delicious and you never get sick, but one person can't even eat a peanut. We can see that's personal karma, but often environmental is shared by millions of people. We can see that, can't we? You live in an area where the food is disgusting, where the water's poison, where the air is polluted. So it's yeah. often collective karma or it can sometimes be individual. But COVID-19 for sure, in, in so far as we get sick, and we are affected by the physical world, and that's our grandma and grandpa now, you know. You understand? So, so instead yes. of pollution, it's actually the people. The people are poison to us. This is kind of heavy-duty karma, you know. Do you understand? Mm. I understand, good. yes. Good, 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 good. That's the Buddhist explanation. Okay, okay. thank you. Good, a pleasure. So it's, it's so interesting, in Australia, there's this, you know, because Australia was very isolated for so long, and of course all you white, all you white palms came along, any white palms there? Maybe some Asian palms, but you white palms came along because we chucked you out. I suppose, the, yeah, the, all the aristocrats threw out the poor working class palms and they went to Australia. And then we started bringing, you brought in, your, you brought your bloody rabbits with you. You brought rabbits with you. Australia has the weirdest creatures on the planet you can find nowhere else. Somebody, an American went to live in Sydney, he said it was like living in Jurassic Park. You couldn't get over the weird creatures in Australia. But, you know, English brought in the rabbits. So one time, and then of course now you got overrun of rabbits, so they got to slaughter the rabbits, you know, because it's all unbalanced. But one, there's one creature in Queensland that they brought in from somewhere when they have all the sugar cane industry. So they brought in this special kind of, they call it a cane toad in order to do something. I can't remember what its job was, but of course it became completely invasive. And these cane toads, apparently people so loathe them because an animal who eats the cane toad will die an agonizing death. They're like their very being is poison. Well, that's almost like, I'm just joking. We are even like that for ourselves now. Other humans are poison to us. It's very heavy karma, you know. We've got to wear masks, not touch each other. It's very powerful, isn't it? Very fascinating. And that's what's interesting about Australia with COVID-19. New Zealand too, a few other countries. But Australia's about 25 million people. Many of the cities are like 5 million people. They got a, like 900 total deaths. They had complete, the government completely took over. They had such strict rules, but they cut COVID-19. I mean, it's, uh, there would have been a, probably a civil war in, in, in the UK if you did it. It's amazing, you know. Only not, not even 1,000 deaths. And most were from, from the quarantine people from coming in from other countries and from the old people's homes. The poor old people's homes, they must... It's awful. Anyway, COVID-19 is very, very, all these diseases, you know. Anytime the environment harms you, that's the fruit of killing. That's why I also joke and talk about Warren Buffett. You know, this American businessman, maybe you've heard of him, he's a multi-millionaire, billionaire. He's like 90. He's famous for being a very down-to-earth fellow. He gave all his $55 billion to Bill's Gate, Bill Gates years ago. And he's probably made another $55 billion since then. But he's really renowned for his very simple lifestyle. I've read his biography, he's a genius businessman. Anyway, he drives the same old Toyota, he lives in the same simple house, he, he, and he eats the same, he's very down-to-earth food. His daughter, in this biography, she said that she's never seen water pass his lips. His diet all his life has been cheeseburgers, vanilla ice cream, and Coca-Cola. Now, normal world, from a point of view of health, he should be dead. 
but he's 90 and he's as fit as a fiddle. Don't, okay, forget about whether he eats hamburgers or not, that's not the point. But the fact that he eats rubbish all his life and he's fit, you should be completely confused by that because the karma, he's got past non-killing karma so strong that whatever he eats nourishes him and he's got a long life. So long life is the fruit of not killing in the past. That's the experience similar to the cause. And the environmental karma of non-killing is that whatever he eats nourishes him. So this is the, so if we can be environmentalists, it's really good, but don't think that just watching, you know, doing your carbon something and putting the plastic here and your something there, that's not enough. It's living in pure ethics. That's the cause of a good environment. So remember that. Do your environmentalist business, but you've got to live in ethics. Don't kill, don't steal, don't lie. I mean, for example, the karmic result of um, sexual misconduct over, you know, intense attachment, jumping on every partner you feel like, harming others with your sexual attachment. The karmic result environmentally is that you live in a place that's stinking and repulsive. Some houses are even like that. You know, people, not just a whole country, the environmental result of attachment, really intense attachment, that you're born in an environment where everything's broken and ugly and nothing ever looks nice. The environmental karmic result of, say, um, abusive language, abusing people, is that you're born in a desert. Nothing can grow. So everything, every being experiences, environmentally, experience, intentions, and their own life. It's the main cause is those beings, you know. It's a very powerful view. So we've got to think this through. It doesn't, not, it doesn't appear natural to us. It doesn't appear evident to us. It's very powerful. Every being, whatever we experience, however the environment impacts upon you, main cause, your past actions. However people see and treat you, main cause, your past actions. Whatever's in your mind, main cause, your past actions. Whatever life you've got, rat, dog, hell being, human, main cause, your past actions. We are our own creators. Dalai Lama calls it self-creation. I find it so delicious, you know. I'd like it best. Better than a creator, for my mind. Anyway, blah, blah, blah. It's 10 to. Time to go home. Where's Margot? Mm. Yeah, I'm here. Oh, good, darling. <laughs> yeah. First of all, I want to thank you, Venerable Rubina. Thank you so much for your amazing teachers. Good. Teaching. good I've job. been sitting on the, on the edge of my seat the whole <laughs> week. <laughs> Fantastic. I just want to thank you so much for your, okay. your kindness, your clarity, Good your sweetheart. answering all these questions. Uh, it's really amazing. I'm happy. And very selfishly, I also want to ask you to please come back soon. To you know, do. please continue uh, teaching to us I'm and come back very soon if you're willing to, to and if to your and did you, busy schedule yeah. allows. And did you get my email this morning? Because Margot kindly offered to make a donation to me. And I would have given it to my body cheetah trust, but I wrote back to her and said, no, I'd like to offer it back to the center. So you use it however you want, okay? Thank you so much. I got it. Thank you so much. Thank Very you. kind. Thank yes. You. Thank you. All right, sweetheart. Um